Now, I could start this video off in a very typical manner, saying Minecraft is the most sold game in existence with 238 million copies sold that it was released in 2011 and has a very active server and modding scene. However, I'm not going to as I have dozens of videos that already make that point clear, which you can check out on the channel after this video. What I'm going to open with is that I, Lunar, am kind of bored with Minecraft. Shocking, right? A Minecraft YouTuber being honest about them kind of being done with the thing they make videos about instead of milking it into the ground? Unheard of. I look forward to being cancelled on Twitter slash SignusMC. Wink. Jokes aside, the reason I focus on the technical aspect of Minecraft is because, one, I want to preserve the history, and two, the game itself kind of lost its charm for me. Except for modding with mods like Create and Industrial Craft that just fundamentally changed the way the game is played but sometimes even that is not enough sometimes i want a bit more sometimes i want a little bit more hardcore and sometimes i want a little bit more challenge lo and behold after scrolling around youtube i found my fix a small game made by an ex hightail dev and his wife together with a bunch of talented individuals focusing on realism with weather systems realistic smelting mechanics chiselable blocks i can't pronounce that word for the life of me animal taming and so much more a game that they themselves would describe as minecraft for adults because it's not just a minecraft clone this is vintage story and to a bigger extent this is what Minecraft actually could have been. So after interviewing both Tyron and Serity, I decided to contribute to the cause and make sure more people know about this wonderful game and its rich history. Let's take a dive in what could be the better version of Minecraft. First off, let's see what the developers themselves say about this game. To quote the website, Vintage Story is an uncompromising wilderness survival sandbox game inspired by eldritch horror teams. Imagine those primitive survival videos, but while the guy's building a mutt hut, Cthulhu is watching from above. The website also boasts its four core beliefs, making the game in a fair and independent manner, meaning no paid DLC, no user monetization and etc. Tailoring a handmade project basically meaning because of their custom made engine, they are not held back by other variables and can make the game look absolutely stunning while keeping performance at the maximum. And we'll get into that later. Crafting a social experience with an open and very tight knit community, both in their Discord and Reddit forums, and especially bundling grief prevention right into their server software. And lastly, it's an open project, not necessarily open source, but they want people to be able to mod the game with their custom modding tools, modding API and database. And these are not just words, picking up the game for yourself for a whopping 18 euros will net you the full game with any updates down the line being integrated with hundreds of mods that can range from just some tweaks to food to Nikola Tesla himself blessing your caveman brain with electricity. And like I said, Tyron was an ex Hytale dev that according to himself realized that it was not the game that he wanted to develop. And you know what? At least Vintage Story is viable and not stuck in dev hell. Oh yeah, wait, I should, I should talk about the game, right? When starting a new game, you start with nothing. Except the shirt on your back and a crippling fear of the sun setting. So, you walk up to a tree, start punching it, and... Nothing happens. Turns out you need to make an axe. So you walk around for a bit, find three flint pieces and a stick, go into your inventory and... Oh, that doesn't work either. What you're supposed to do is put the flint on the floor and absolutely smash that thing with another piece of flint until it resembles an axe. In this game, nothing is given to you except for some vague directions, a helpful guide, and for some reason, 20 million wolves to the point that I think it's a subtle hint from the game developers for me to start a space wolf army. <laughs> but tangent aside, Keenite among you might have noticed something. You don't have an inventory. Of course not, silly. Look, look at you. You don't have any pockets. Why would you even keep that stack of... Don't answer that question. No, you need to collect cattails and combine it into your inventory to make a basket, which gives you a whopping four inventory slots. 
Guess you can't be too hopeful in this world, eh? The upside is you can fit four of these inventory expansion hotbar, meaning with just some cattails, you can get up to 16 slots, which doesn't sound like a lot, and it isn't, but it's better than nothing, I suppose. But uh-oh, it's turning nighttime. Better craft a knife, harvest some grass, and start a campfire, because at night, these things crawl out of hell to drag you back into it. These creatures are called drifters, and they are tied to the deep lore of this game, which we will get back into later. But seeing these things will make the gear in the middle of your hotbar spin faster than Hammond spinning off a track in Top Gear. If that gets too low, you will enter the LSD dimension, where nothing makes sense anymore. But hey look, it's daytime again. Congratulations, you survived. Now you better start running because drifters don't burn up during the day, and congratulations! you died. Yeah, to say the early game is absolutely brutal would be an understatement. A pig in a slaughterhouse would look at you playing this with pity in its eyes. But once you establish yourself, get a house, a spear, some cheap armor to protect yourself, you will still die because you forgot hunger was a thing. But Lunar, I hear you ask, I am inside your walls. How do I prevent starvation? Well, my friend, that's very simple. You start cooking, of course. First, you need a pot in order to cook in. So, you go out, find a clay pit, start digging with your trusty spade, get back to your ship brick of a house, open your inventory- Oh, yeah, right, this isn't Minecraft. Yeah, right. Uh, you need to put the clay on the floor, then select the cooking pot and actually form the clay into the shape you selected. And let me just tell you, these things feel so more personal when you make them yourself. It's a shame you can't, like, paint these things like the ancient Greeks did. Anyways, you finish your pot and put it on the stove. And yeah, yeah, this joke is getting old, isn't it? What you need to do is dig a one by one hole, put the pot in there, fill it with some hay, put some sticks on it and then light it up. Same goes for the croc, the early game storage system. Because a chest in this game requires you to saw logs into planks and have nails which are made from copper. So the next step is obvious. It's time for... Now for many players, including myself, the copper age is where this game gets really good. As you just go from surviving to actually trying to thrive. With tools that do more damage and more reliable, meaning you just feel more safe. Except at night, because drifters will continue to harass you like a fly harasses shit. It's at this point where you see a message appear in your chat box. Temporal storm imminent. You think nothing of it until, dear god, the walls are turning, my speakers are making unholy noise, the stuff is spawning in, what does this even mean? Why is there a giant walker in the background? Yeah, this is what I mean with the LSD dimension. These storms happen from time to time and are essentially a blood moon ranging from light, medium, to heavy. If you are not prepared for the temporal storm, you will die. It's gotten to the point that on our community server, we have people reporting temporal storm in the chat just so that people don't just log into hell itself opening up. After the storm, you can go out and find some copper. Notice how you can't make a flint pickaxe, meaning you can only pick up copper chunks laying on the ground. Once you've found enough though, you can make a mold out of clay for a pickaxe. As where these copper bits are found, there's usually a good amount of copper ore beneath them as well. So you smelt the nuggets, cast into a mold, Oh, you thought you could smelt copper just with firewood, didn't you? No, 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 no. That will only burn to 110 degrees Celsius. You need either coal or charcoal. Coal can be found in the wild, but without a pickaxe, good luck getting it. And charcoal can be made in a charcoal kiln. What's that? How do, how do you craft a charcoal kiln? Silly. You don't. You don't craft that. You dig a hole in the ground, fill it up with firewood, light it up on fire with a campfire, and then go to bed to skip the night. Except you don't skip the night. You only skip six hours in your hay bale that you call a bed. Anyways, now that you have your charcoal, you put that into your campfire so you can smelt the copper nuggets. Make sure to actually craft a pair of tongs, because you can't just hold an object that's 1000 degrees Celsius, dumbass, and then cast it into a mold. After all this work, you are rewarded with the most satisfying sound imaginable. Ah, that's the stuff, baby. Seriously, if this doesn't get your rocks off, I don't know what will. It's usually around this time that you start noticing the rain increasing in frequency, as the clouds you see above you are actually simulated weather patterns. We found this out when on our server, a group of players known as the Coffee Republic was set up to the west of us, and they were complaining about the rain all the time. When then five minutes later, we saw the thunderstorm that they were complaining about approaching us as theirs just passed. It's so amazing for immersion. Speaking of immersion, I hope you like dying. Yeah, at this point, death is not off the table yet, and truly, it never is. All you can do is craft some better gear, 
And after you craft some better tools, a better spear, and if you're lucky, a lantern, you notice snow falling down. A little bit at first, but then it doesn't stop snowing. Winter has come, my friends, and you better have prepared yourself with a cellar stocked with food, because otherwise, get ready to know what it's like in a Siberian gulag. Winter is harsh, very, very harsh. It's by far the biggest point more casual players turn off the game, as it's just too much at this point. As winter is a mess, food doesn't grow, animals give less meat as they themselves are starving, snow piles up, meaning you could just get snowed in if you're not careful enough. And in these harsh conditions, the game still shines through. I'm not running any shaders here. This is how the game looks from the start. It runs smooth. I've got a pretty good rig, but I've seen people with GT 730s running this game on medium settings with 60 FPS and still get god rays like this. It's amazing that a game this complex can run so well. And while we were talking about performance, you have starved to death. I do have to mention the difficulty can entirely be customized to what you want it to be. But after a long and tiresome journey, you finally have it. You can now make your internal Da Vinci go loose and chisel every crafted block. You can even add other blocks to your current block you're working on, so you can give that cobblestone wall a nice wooden rim. And Add even more details to your mud hut. I'm not joking here, by the way. You can make mud bricks. And then it happens. The snow stops falling, the temperature gets higher, and your character stops shivering like it's getting Vietnam flashbacks. It's spring, and it's beautiful. This is just how a typical early game of Vintage Story goes. And with that all being said, that brings me to... There's no denying it. While this game is immersive down to its crafting mechanisms, weather patterns, interactions, and a buttload of other stuff, it's hard. Really hard. While I did mention you can lower the difficulty, a casual Andy isn't going to sit around messing with sliders to tilt the ratio of wolves biting their ass until it's just right. While the difficulty is its biggest plus, it's also its biggest minus as it usually attracts only people seeking its challenge. Then there is the issue that it's not on any major platforms, hence why you never heard of it. And why is that? Is it because Steam takes a massive cut out of sales? Well, I asked Tyron directly, and according to him, it's purely because he wants his game to grow slowly, as it gives him more time to implement key features he thinks should be in the game before it gets a massive player base and before he considers it finished. By the way, the interview with Tyron and Sarity is free on my Patreon, link below if you want to read all of this, as I don't think charging money for an interview about two devs that made a game that's all about its community would be a good thing. As for now though, Vintage Story is and will likely forever be a niche title. And actually, that's a good thing. I don't want mainstream reviewers getting their grubby hands on this game and blasting it because it's too hard. Wait. Am, am I the bad guy? While I had Tyron's attention, I also asked when he would see this massive project finished. His answer was simple. Once the plot was there, then he would think it was finished. At the moment, he thinks it's about 10% finished. Because this game has a deep, deep lore, which I'm surprised no one has made a video about. Can somebody get on that, please? In any case, it's a great game, spearheaded by two passionate developers who made their mod into their own game, with its own engine, its own story, and most of all, its own dedicated community of players. With regular updates and their recent migration to Net7, opening the door to even more performance with hundreds of players on a single server on the horizon, I think it's safe to say that if you're bored of Minecraft, give it a shot. It's cheaper and you will get hours of time out of it. But with that being said, I was Lunar, you were awesome, and Willux, I want my axe back. I would like to thank my many patrons on the Patreon for their monetary support, and of course, thank you to my lovely boulders Yoyens, Rebecca, Sneesonix, and Willox for supporting me. And who could forget the lovely giants that are my mountain supporters? Comet Speed, Hans, Kikiso, and especially Farron for your support in these recent times. I know this video was a little bit different than I usually do, but I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. And if you would like to support me and read the full interview with the VS devs here, feel free to join the Patreon on patreon.com slash See you later, lads.